Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for June the 13th, 2012. I'm John Hofel, and joining me today are Cody Jones and Ben Dennison of The Basement and Lyndon LaRouche. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning. Well, we are going back on uh, cycling again, but this time a fresh shot. The problem is that we have been in the past, we have done a lot of work on the question of nature, or the history of nature in terms of the system. <clears throat> now we're going to divide it a bit. We're going to distinguish analytically the difference between mankind on the one side and animal life and other forms of life. And we're going to try to correlate the way in which these processes interact and work uh, to get to that further point. Uh, this is also correlated with what has happened with, uh, in, in terms of our development with Fertwängler, in terms of the, the discovery of, that he's made. And at this time, we should be looking at the whole system from the standpoint of the Fertwängler uh, discovery of the nature of human, the human mind. So we can distinguish between the human mind, its interaction between nature in general and other, other forms of, of life apart from mankind, and thus get a better picture of how we can correlate the development of man on Earth and implicitly go into the question of man in the solar system. So these are different categories as defined, uh, and we have to re correlate these categories and determine what their interaction is and what it should be. And that will give us a fresh start on what we've already done. It will be the same thing, but it will be more. It will be a fresh start looking at this thing more analytically as if we were planning the, the development of man on Earth, not just in te certain territories, but mankind's habitation of Earth and mankind's habitation of the solar system and beyond. And to get some correlations in terms of through life, in terms of the factor of life, and how it, how it affects and how we must change perhaps some of our practices on Earth and beyond based on these considerations rather than just taking these things as man plopped into whatever is there. Right. We have to steer the development of all living processes and also steer the development of the environment in which they function. So I think Cody's going to start. Yes. Well, in honor of our friend Furt Wangler, We'll start where he would start, which is from the future, Good. from where man must be, and that is in space. Now, what we're in the process of developing now is sort of reworking of the idea of the Moon-Mars project, of what really has to be the forefront of where man has to go. Now, for many people, this becomes, this, is a, this has a certain uh, discontinuity in their mind because going all the way back to the Apollo program, the argument has always been, well, this is unpractical. All right, we're going to go into space. We're going to spend all this money whenever we have all these problems here on Earth. We've got people that are starving. We've got war. We've got collapse of cities. And you're saying we're going to put all our effort and money into sending a man into space? That's highly impractical. And it's true. It is impractical. But it's absolutely necessary. And that's often the case, is that that which is practical is usually practical from the standpoint of the past, of trying to hold on to the past. But that which is necessary is always a movement into the future, of redefining what the future must be and having that shape what you must do now. So for us, the future is in the stars, so to speak. The Moon-Mars development project, the colonization of space, man moving into the next dimension of existence. Now to get at an idea of the principle that's involved in this, we're going to now look at it from the standpoint of how life as a principle utilized this, this idea of the future determining its movement. Because it's actually a, a universal principle. It's not just something simply that's a, a, a machination of, of arbitrary human thought, but it's a principle that governs how the universe as a whole unfolds. The universe always operates from the standpoint of the future. So what we'll look at is a parallel that has occurred in the past in the development of life. 
specifically the movement of life out of the oceans onto land, which at the time, in terms of the current, the state of life at the time that it was in the oceans, the movement onto land was extremely impractical. If you look at how life existed, particularly plant life existed in the oceans, everything seemed to be perfect, right? It had a very easygoing existence, uh, but it was a very passive existence. The way it obtained its nutrients was sort of a passive movement of nutrients through the water and it would absorb it, sort of an osmotic kind of process. Um, reproduction, sexual reproduction was sort of passive. You sort of have the, the sperm and the eggs released into the ocean. They would sort of passively combine. Um, movement was passive. You basically just flow along with the currents. But everything seemed to be hunky-dory for life in the oceans. So the idea that then life would move out of this very comfortable environment of the oceans onto land was extremely impractical because at the time land was very dry whereas the oceans obviously are, are very moist, very wet. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of seemingly available nutrients on land. It was all locked up and trapped in, in rocks and, and in the soil. So the, the idea that life would then move out of the oceans onto land into a much more hostile, um, foreboding environment seemed completely impractical. But what we'll find is that in doing that, it actually represented a necessary shift and increase in the power of life to further transform the planet. That doing what was at the time impractical was absolutely necessary. So what did you have? So as life moved out of the oceans onto land, it had to develop certain new technologies to facilitate its existence on land. Uh, for example, one of the main innovations that life had to, to come up with was the development of hydraulic systems, where it had to figure out a way to move water out of sort of the, the, the ground and move it up into, a, into another dimension, basically. So you're moving off of the surface and now transporting water up into, into the air. So life had to develop a certain ability to move water upwards. So it introduced a kind of hydraulic system into its activity, where now life was now moving into a new dimension. Um, you had, for example, the ability to get nutrients required life then taking on a symbiotic relationship with certain kinds of fungi, where because of the the structure of, of the roots and things that life was developing, it was very, it, the nutrients had a tough time getting into the plant. So it had to utilize certain kinds of fungi that would break down and, and grab the nutrients, pump it into the plants, and the plants in exchange would then give some sugars and some energy to the fungi. So you had this new relationships were developing, basically among whole different kingdoms. Right? You had the fungal kingdom and then you had the plant kingdom had to come into a new kind of relationship, a symbiotic relationship. So you had an increased connectivity between different domains of life as life moved on to land. Um, you then had the necessity for an increased capture of solar radiation, right? So life developed leaves. What you had with the development of, of leafy structures was that it basically increased the overall area that plant life could use for capturing solar radiation. So in effect, you're increasing the overall area of capture of solar radiation through the development of, of leaves. <clears throat> you have things like what the roots were doing and going down and breaking up the soil and exposing more and more of the soil to the elements. So you had an increased weathering process, which in effect then started to move more and more of the what were locked up uh, materials of the earth started to move them more and more through the biosphere. So you had an increase of what Vernadsky would call the biogenic migration of materials. So now you had a flow of carbon dioxide, you had a f more greater flow of oxygen, you had a release of a lot of the materials and minerals that were locked up in the rocks were now being broken down and moved actively through living processes. Through that you then had started to have the development of weather systems. Right, where now you're starting to actively, life as it's through the transpiration process of moving water up through its system up into the air, you're now creating the potential for weathering systems, cloud formation. 
as you do that, it created the ability then for life to move away from the coast and further and further inland and bringing the water cycle with it as it moved inland. And so then you started to have, create the ability for life to move away from just the coast and deeper and deeper into the continents, bringing water to the continents, breaking up the rock, creating soil, and creating further conditions for life to exist and to exist at an even, at an even higher potential. Right, you're increasing the flow of materials, you're increasing the rate of turnover of life. You had an overall shift in what we would discuss as an increase in energy flux density. The energy flux density of the system was increasing, was moving upwards. Now in doing that, it started to transform even whole new type, create whole new types of processes on the planet. As we've discussed with the development of weather systems, you know, I had the development of things like lightning. Lightning now became a necessary component of the development of the biosphere. Lightning has a couple of different roles that it plays. One of the ones that most people recognize is the role of lightning in creating, in liberating nitrogen, which would then go down and become one of the main nutrients for the plants themselves. Right? You had a sort of an electrolysis process where you're liberating nitrogen from the atmosphere. It's raining down and then it's feed becoming a major nutrient for the plants. Another effect was the creation of the, the lower frequency Schumann resonances, which themselves become something which is tapped into and utilized by higher animal life, particularly mammals, who a lot of our uh, biological function is regulated through things like the Schumann resonances. Also, a lot of brain activity seems to be tuned into the frequencies of the Schumann resonance. So you had, with life moving out of the oceans onto land, you had the necessity for life to develop new technologies which brought directly under its control a lot of processes which previously, when it was in the oceans, were much more passive. Right? Like, for example, we discussed reproduction. Whereas in the oceans, reproduction was somewhat of a, a passive, hit or miss kind of a process. Once life went on to land, it had to develop new technologies, in effect, to be able to overcome the challenges of reproduction on land. First, you had sort of the, the simple spore process, where you had to at least have some shallow waters, where you'd have a, you know, an egg and, and some sperm dropped into a shallow pond, and then they would kind of connect through the waters, and you'd get some new plant life that way. Once life moved further onto land, it developed an ability where it no longer required sort of shallow waters in order to do that. It then developed things like the ability for, for pollination, where you have a seed in the pollen and you're getting the, the development of the fertilization of the egg right there in the plant itself, which actually was um, facilitated by the introduction of new types of animal life into the biosphere, like butterflies and bees which often play a very crucial role in the, the pollination process. So you have this condition where as life moves onto land, it's developing, it's having to figure out new ways under its own control to facilitate its development. So it's developing these technologies. The biosphere is introducing new types of life, new types of connections. Where you're getting multiple kingdoms are now necessarily interrelating. You've got the plant kingdom, you've got the fungal kingdom, you've got the animal kingdom. They all necessarily are becoming more and more intertwined and connected to increase the overall power of life to exist and to, and to push itself forward. Now, one of the, the residual effects of this was that because of the weathering process and the breakdown of the rocks and, and the materials, you had an increase of flow of materials now back actually into the oceans. So the development of life on land actually created the conditions to increase the amount of material that was flowing into the oceans. So the oceans themselves and the life in the oceans themselves directly benefited from life moving onto land. Life in the oceans became more abundant and more powerful because of the movement of life onto land. So you have the overall system as a whole in doing what was seemingly the impractical of moving out of the oceans onto land actually created the necessary conditions for life to go through a fundamental revolution and upshift 
in its overall energy flux density capacity. So the impractical was actually necessary. For the system to move to the higher order, it necessarily had to go through this kind of a revolution. And in doing that, develop new capabilities where now life was directly in control of many of the functions which are necessary for life's existence. Whereas previously, they're much more of sort of passive, you know, had more of a passive relationship to its environment. Now it was developing a much more directly controlled relationship to its environment. Similarly, that's the kind of thing we can see as we talk about man moving off of Earth into space. I mean, just to mention a couple of things that we, we tend to take for granted here. I mean, most people, most farmers, for example, when they go out and, and think about planting, they don't go out and take measurements of the geomagnetic field or go out and, and register what the Schumann resonances are. Right? They sort of go out and they, they take account of common thing. You know, what's the rain level? What's the nutrients in the soil? But there are a lot of things that they sort of take for granted. These are things, though, that as we move into space, we can't take for granted. You look at the moon. You look at Mars. Very different electromagnetic environments than what we have here on Earth. Obviously, different gravity potentials than we have here on Earth. Neither the moon nor Mars has its own um, planetary magnetic field. So these are things that we're starting to realize, though, are very necessary for supporting human life, right? Things like we discussed, the Schumann resonances. If the Schumann resonance is very necessary for certain kind of biological regulation, for certain regulation of brain functioning, if that's not there on Mars, for example, well, then that's something that we're going to have to actually synthetically create. We're going to have to think about how to overcome that kind of challenge. We're going to have to think about how to overcome certain, say, challenges of how food might grow differently in a different magnetic or gravitational field. And so a lot of those things which we sort of have a passive relationship to here on Earth, the gravitational field, the geomagnetic field, the electromagnetic environment, even the relationship to things like cosmic radiation, which right now is highly regulated through our atmosphere, an atmosphere which developed over many hundreds of millions of years through the activity of life. All those things which we don't necessarily account for and have a very passive relationship to, as we move into space, we're going to have to take direct control of. We're going to have to think about what kind of technologies, what kind of new technologies will we have to develop in order to control these kinds of these elements of the environment. In doing that, we're going to totally transform man's relationship to the universe. Because now, we're going to have to bring totally into our control these kinds of elements. And in doing so, we'll actually probably increase then the power of man and its relationship to these. I mean, for example, there's no, there's no reason to think that our current relationship to, say, the electromagnetic spectrum is the perfect one. It's adequate for our needs here on Earth, but maybe there's, as we have to think about bringing that more and more into our control, maybe there's a, a more perfect tuning. Maybe we can tune in more perfectly to certain aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. But those are things that we wouldn't necessarily meet those challenges unless we push the boundaries of where man could exist. So by pushing those boundaries of where man necessarily must go, such as the moon and Mars, and meeting the challenges of doing that, we're going to have to bring more and more into our direct control and away from this kind of passive relationship, these kinds of elements. And in doing that, we're going to see a total upshift in the power of man to exist. The technologies that will come about, such as having to master things like the fusion process, the matter-antimatter process, mastering the electromagnetic spectrum, all those things are going to represent a total upshift in the energy flux density capabilities of mankind. And what we'll find, similar to what we saw with uh, the relationship of life onto land and the oceans, all of this is then going to actually feed back and increase the power of man even here on Earth. Right? The spin-offs are going to then increase man's own capability here on Earth, because now we'll start to even master those processes here. So that's, that's why we say it's absolutely necessary 
for us to adopt and take on this mission of man moving into space. So it's, you know what I mean, just as a side note too, we can, they're already, as you can imagine, in today's society, which is so obsessed with sex, they're already starting to figure out ways in which you can overcome the problem of, of zero gravity reproduction and whatnot. So there is, there's already work in that direction as it is, but, but we'll see. This is, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to adopt as a mission. And I think as the weeks go on, we'll make it more and more clear to people that this is real economics, right? This is what it is to be man in the universe, to be of the mind of the universe. And so I just throw that out there and maybe uh, see, Ben, you can follow yeah. up on some of that. I mean, just to kind of emphasize one, I mean, some we've illustrated repeatedly and repeatedly, I think it's good to kind of focus on is this question of the constant, you're looking at with these, each of these systems, you're looking at constant processes of change and development, and just kind of, because the point is, you know, the, you're starting, you know, we discussed it before in terms of if you look at the, just start with the planet by itself without life. That has a certain chemistry, a certain composition to it. Then you add life to it, and you're looking at how does life, what's the rate of change at which life transforms the planet? Then you introduce mankind as a new form of life, a completely new qualitative form of life, and you're looking at what's the rate of change at which mankind transforms both the biosphere and the planet itself. To, you know, starting from there, when you're talking about economics, when you're talking about mankind uh, living on this planet, that's kind of like the baseline you have to start from. You're starting from the standpoint that there's no just, you know, like everything you're describing, this, this entire, everything that we've experienced in terms of the history of life on Earth, the history of the development of the solar system is change. It's change, it's development. So when you're talking about economics, you know, you're not talking about just marginal improvements here or there, building a project, product here or there. You're looking at what is mankind doing to uh, interact with and continue to subsume and control these rates of change. And so you know, I think that's come out very clearly in, the, in this whole life studies we have done. Because if you really study that process and you, get, you, get, you, rid your, you rid your mind of all these crazy assumptions of the second law, uh, some equal balance of nature or something, you get this crap out of the way. What, what, what are you then left with as the actual substance of the process? What, what's the universal character that you keep coming back to as underlying the experience of the universe that we, that we know of? You know, there's, there's no fixed baseline. What you come to is what's the rate of change? And what's the change of the rate of change? And, you know, you, you, and you continue to find these equivalents of this energy flux density conception as the key to the whole process. So, I mean, again, I think we're going to, you know, the focus of these coming sessions is really going to be to demonstrate and illustrate that as a fundamental principle that has to govern mankind, that has to consciously govern all of our activity at this point is how do we actually increase our uh, ability to, our rate of change of transformation, and not just the Earth now, but the whole solar system. And, you know, and again, this has come out very clearly in this whole history of life, because as you're going through, I mean, one thing that struck me in just doing the studies is, for example, when you look at life, uh, you, know, you did this whole work on the oxygen revolution, so-called, huge transformation in the system of life. Uh, where life went from a, created this whole free oxygen system that then completely changed the chemistry, changed the uh, energetic rate of the whole environment. Uh, an oxygen uh, 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 metabolic system is a much more energetic system. So you have uh, the constant process. So you move from that, then you move to these whole uh, three levels, these, this conical presentation we developed, these three systems of the cones. We have successive increases of the rate of energy flux density of the life system. But if you actually map that onto what's, what's the effect of that process, you, you look at life continually spreading, like you're saying, onto land, further into the oceans, and always increasing the rate at which life is actually transforming the environment, uh, increasing the concentration of ores, increasing the amount of different minerals that can exist, increasing the different forms of biological organization that can exist. 
So you're getting a constant process of, uh, you're never dealing with just a some fixed state. You're always dealing with uh, the uh, a planetary system, what's the rate at which life has transformed the planetary system, and any competent understanding of mankind has to look at then from the standpoint of these relative developing systems, what is mankind's action upon that process? And what we're going to be demonstrating, illustrating, is that we have to go to this question of energy flux density to understand that process. You know, we've sketched some of this out before, I mean, a lot of times. If you just take, you know, in broad strokes, you know, Lynn, you put some of this out a couple of years ago with this question of the successive platforms yeah. of mankind's development, where you look at mankind moving from predominantly a maritime system, ocean, trans transoceanic system, to then beginning to move inland and transform the, the in inland of the continents with uh, navigational systems, uh, canal systems inland, and then moving to a higher level as a function with the uh, rail systems, the beginning of development of inland areas with these rail systems, and then moving to uh, the level of a nuclear economy, and then what we see in the frontier of a you know, s truly space-faring uh, species, that what you're seeing this is purely a function of mankind. I mean, I like the term you used at one point, which was you, you look at what we need to do to colonize Mars, to bring mankind to Mars. You're talking about creating a, what you could call a synthetic environment on Mars. You're not just like plopping down a base or something. You're looking at mankind actually creating the entirety of the synthetic environment to sustain all of human life. But the thing is, that that's not unique to just that particular process. That's the entire history of human civilization, and that's the entire history of life, is a constant creation of what, from the standpoint of the previous level, is a new quality of environment, what you, call, what you could call a synthetic environment. You know, even the development of the entire interior of the, of the continents by mankind, that was creating a whole new synthetic, you know, physical, economic space-time for mankind's existence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, life did the same thing. The moving on to land was creating, everything you're describing is creating a synthetic environment that from the standpoint of just the earth itself, just as a chemical non-living system, you know, life created its own synthetic conditions to exist. You know, the oxygen revolution, another similar example of life creating a synthetic conditions for, its, for itself to exist. But the point is that's not just like a one stage thing. That, that the, the principle of the entire development is that of that quality. It's the constant rate of change and transformation of these systems. And the only really metric you have to get at the substance of that is this question of energy flux density. So I mean, we're really, the, you know, we're going to, you know, the, the point now is we have to illustrate that because if we're actually going to deal with the types of, we've had a lot of discussions, for example, of the threat of comets, asteroids, you know, it, it, but this is even just some of the most basic Thing. If, we, if we had a competent uh, international policy, you know, by the 90s, we would have already had much more serious moves towards developing the types of systems that we need to protect mankind from just even this most basic, obvious threat. But that's even just the beginning. You have a whole questions of radiations, solar radiations, galactic radiations, that we know in the past have devastated life in, in vari from various qualities of radiations. So the question is, what is mankind going to what does mankind need to do to bring uh, a new level of dominance that increase mankind's sphere of control, so to speak? Make all of the, make the entire orbital, the Earth-Moon system, the entire uh, Earth-Mars Earth relationship, we have to make that an entire synthetic environment. We have to take that entire environment from the standpoint of uh, 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 space rocks, bodies involved, forms of radiation, forms of transportation. We have to actually be thinking about how do we actually take that entire system of the Earth, Moon, Mars system and make that now an completely in the domain of mankind, completely in the control of mankind. And it is going to be a question of actually defining that as the goal and defining the necessary breakthroughs in energy flux density and power conceptions needed to achieve that goal. You know, so, so putting, there's a certain quality of the progress that has to kind of subsume the way people think about economics, profit, value, progress. You know, you don't, you don't just go piecemeal by, you know, I got this little new technology here, I built this thing there. 
we want to, we got to push towards the question of what are, what are the what are the governing qualitative factors that then determine a lot of the subsuming predicates? What's actually going to determine mankind's ability to develop new technologies, to develop new medical care, to develop all the things we need? What's actually going to determine that capability for mankind to do that? And how do we actually organize ourselves to ensure that that you have that qualitative step, which again is you know is the entire history of not just mankind but life and the universe as we know it is this, is this progression, this qualitative progression. So I mean, just to kind of, that'll, we'll be illustrating that in successive layers, that this is the principle governing the universe as we know it, this increase in energy flux density. Mm -hmm. So what we've said so far poses the really fun question, the question of the human mind. And the very few people, especially those who have human minds, know how to use them. That's the particular point to be emphasized. For example, let's take the case of higher forms of life, conscious, noetic forms of life. The reference point for this in terms of the history of biological systems and so forth is the point at which when did man become creative? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it is human creativity which is the mystery and also the implicit answer to all of the questions which what we discussed now mm. come to fore. That's, that's the crucial question. Man in the universe. And what, that, what does it mean? Now, man is a very difficult thing to deal with at first glance because we have apes. Mm. Uh, and when does an ape begin to think? That is in the sense of a noetic process a noetic innovation, because apes do not have that capability. You have all kinds of animal life, and you can see with dogs and so forth, they all have the ability, particularly under human interactions. The thing, the valuable thing about the, the cat is very intractable. <laughs> and the, the cat is very independent, which means it's very stupid. The dog is attracted to mankind. Man, the dog adapts to mankind and thus is interacting with the creative processes which are unique to the human species. No other species known to us on earth is creative. Others are innovative, but that's not creativity because you can build mechanical systems, electronic systems, which are innovative. You can design innovation into mm -hmm. the system. And a lot of the fakery like uh, was done during the period uh, between uh, post war World War II mm -hmm. was done like on this kind of thing of that taking innovation like dividing robots and so forth could we develop a robot as a man right uh, mm -hmm. this sort of nonsense but there is a there is a point here how do we get to the distinction historically and biologically between the ape and man What's the difference? How does this, where does this come into existence? What's the distinction? Huh? Well, let's look at the human species. We can go back several, some millions of years on the existence of the human species in terms of evidence of the human species. But how do we, de how do we define something that looked like a man or a mankind type, type of creature and an actual human being? Mm -hmm. Where in the process of history and evidence can we just make that distinction? Wasn't there a point at which something looked like a human being, seemed to behave like a human being, but was really something more than a monkey? Now, what's the relationship between the biological development of a species which has man-like behavior, apparently, and an actual human being? Now, sometimes I, I admit when it comes to dealing with greenies, it's very difficult to make that <laughs> distinction because the greenies themselves, are, if they have any human capability, they're trying to hide it by the nature of their behavior and devotions. Um, it's their religious devotion, I believe. But the point is, when, when did man actually manifest as a species a difference from an animal? Because it's an important question. Now, there's only one way which in terms of biologists and so forth and historians, we can make that distinction. We are an approximate distinction. 
and that is the use of fire, the voluntary use of fire, where the man of use of fire is not an accident, but it's, it's an intention. We, the, we get examples of that going back a couple of million years into that direction. The, the first evidence we get of mankind as using fire, and these occur at sites, mm -hmm. typically South Africa is an area of, of this sort of evidence. <clears throat> At these sites, we find that creatures, which are man-like in some respects, as other things are, which distinguish themselves by the use of fire. So fire, fire site evidence is the most crucial thing from which we start in reference to try to define the distinction between ape and man. And the whole system depends upon that. Now, you have question marks. You, for example, you have greenies. Now they seem to be a reversion to a pre-human condition. It, and it's not a joke. It's because their sociological behavior, like the behavior of the British monarchy. The British monarchy is trying to reduce human potential, both intellectually as well as physically, uh, down to the level of one billion people from now seven. And the, the whole program of the Greeny program is to revert man, man back to the beast or something less than the beast. So the creative power is what's being crushed. And this, pro, this portends, if the Greeny problem continues, the extinction of the human species, the self-inflicted extinction. Because of the attritional practice already there, Without the innovative aspect, which is the creative powers of man, the human mind, and the development of more advanced, advanced technologies, in effect, without that, the human species cannot exist. So the Queen of England has declared herself as unfit to exist, implicitly, or being the only thing that is allowed to exist otherwise. Mm -hmm. right? So this is the great question. And the, where, the question is defined where? It's defined simply for any of us who are in this department, the only way we can really get a definition of man is by going to the use of fire by mankind. The voluntary use of fire by mankind is our first in primary clue to what human beings are. And the human being's history from that point that we fired the first fire site evidence that we get way back from primitive man, so-called, who's using fire. And he leaves behind fire, the bones, and all these kinds of things, which typify this thing. Now, mankind then goes on. Mankind then takes off, not on the basis of biology as such, though man's biology is changed by man's existence. But the willful characteristic of man's behavior changes progressively. And the continued existence of the human species beyond that point depends upon this innovative process. In other words, it's not an accidental, it's not rubbing this against that, it's not something of this. This creature actually develops ideas. And we know they're ideas because the use of fire is an idea. And the use of fire sites as archaeological places our indication of that. Now, now you look at the thing about, say, let's look at a, a case study. Economists. Hmm. Are economists human? That is the question. Because today's economists are, are not, in that respect, human. They are human in the sense that they will pick up objects and use them if they like them. That's the human aspect. Their creativity, in terms of the system, is close to nil or less. Uh, today it's becoming less. The more people they are, the more stupid they are. Well, it's because that's an imposed policy by the oligarchical system on mankind. But man, the voluntary role of mankind as creativity. Now what do you get? Look what you get when you're, when you're dealing with what I'm dealing with, the economy. You're dealing with mass stupidity that since the assassination of Jack Kennedy, 
the United people of the United States and also generally in Europe have become increasingly stupid, regret regressing in the direction of becoming virtual animals rather than human beings. Because the innovative power, the, the, uh, the creative power on which the human species' existence depends, humanity requires the creativity which mankind creates. Otherwise, ma mankind becomes extinct because there are the factors out there which, are, which do that. And the, you take the economists. Virtually every economist who's well known uh, that I know about is stupid. Why are they stupid? This came up in, it came up at the end, beginning, 2021, 1921, and beyond, 1971 in particular. I was the only economist who had forecast back in 1966 the in inevitability under the present trend of a break in the system. And it occurred. And no economist, leading economist in the United States, who was actually broadcasting anything, mm -hmm. had actually accurately understood is what this break was. I was the only one economist in the nation who was known who had actually forecast this development, which I had made clear in 1966 that we were headed into that process under the influence of the kind of ideas and policies which are being introduced in the United States. I said in 1966, if we continue this policy direction, policy making direction, we're going to have a collapse in the relatively near future. Now you can never, from the standpoint of what I do, exactly predict definite dates. Once in a while you can get a clue which will give you a definite date of a probable develop event in the economy, in general. But no economist, none of the leading economists in the United States, who are at all visible as any kind of activity as a, as a forecaster, had not failed or had even denied the possibility of what I had forecast, which indicates that an exercise in stupidity was in process, that mankind was not actually thinking. This is an example of what the function of human beings is, is to innovate in ways which are necessary to project the continued existence of the human species from otherwise attritional destruction. And we've now been going through a process of partly willful in terms of current activity, but in long term, a willful decision by mankind through the institutions that control mankind to destroy mankind, to deny and prevent the function of creativity. You see this completely, especially since 19, you know, uh, 1971, 1971. That was a turning point. And since that time, the United States has been degenerating, economically and otherwise. The intelligence, the intellectual level of the citizens of the United States has been degenerating. People are becoming successfully more stupid. And the rate of stupidity, as you see in our young people, is accelerating. You take people in, you know, from the time of going going into the kindergarten or something, hmm. into into about the age of sixteen, and you're finding a terrible destruction of the mental powers and the morality of our young people as a result of this cultural trend, which is the cultural trend which is insisted upon by the Queen of England in particular, the cultural trend which this president of ours represents: stupidity, aggressive stupidity of a type which is mass murderous. And the guy is a mass murderer anyway, as he's already demonstrated. So this is the, the great issue. The issue is, with, in forecasting, you see exactly that economists in general, in, as a group, there are obviously exceptions as individuals, but as a group, economists are intrinsically stupid. And that behavior proves it. They have no understanding of what progress is. The greenies in particular are a species which is unfit to exist. That is, the behavior of the greenie as a greenie is the mark of a, of a species which is unfit to exist or to continue to exist. And as opposed to mankind, who is what? Mankind is the firebringer. Mm -hmm. Mankind is the image of the 
Prometheus, the firebringer, as against the Zeus, the evil man, which is what the British Empire represents, uh, the tradition of, of the oligarchy, of the oligarchical principle. And that's where our problem lies. So our, our problem is to understand, first of all, that mankind is not an animal who evolved as an animal. Mankind has animal characteristics because mankind is completely distinct from most economists, among other things, because of this issue, the issue of creativity, as we call it, voluntary creativity. Now, the universe is creative. We've both discussed this already. The universe is inherently creative. But from the standpoint of mankind, it isn't. Because mankind means, by creati creativity for mankind, means this innovative capability, which is lacking in the higher apes and lacking among most economists today, as you can demonstrate even rather easily. Mm -hmm. They don't know what reality is. And therefore, the, the question we face is how do we utilize human ability called creativity to define what humanity is. In other words, it's, humanity is not people running around on two legs or something like that huh? and calling themselves human. Mm -hmm. That's not humanity. Humanity is something which is man as the firebringer. Man is the Promethean firebringer. And what you will find is the opponents of culture will all denounce the Promethean principle. The Promethean principle is simply that man is the voluntary firebringer, as no other known species to us, known to us, is. If we could find some species somewhere else in the, in the galaxy, we would say oh, he's a firebringer, in this sense, a voluntary firebringer. Then you say, well, this, this guy's human class. As most of, our most of our economists today, we couldn't describe mm -hmm. as that. But this is the great issue. The issue is, is humanity and the role of creativity since the first evidence of man using fire, which defi defines a f difference between mankind and other species. Now, what we're going to do, what we're aiming to do, insofar as we know the solar system, and we start generally with the moon, we recognize there that man is entering into the solar system. We have no other evidence, at least presently, of that occurring in any other part of the solar system than on Earth. So now we've come to a point where the very continued existence of mankind, as we know from the threats which are implicit in the history, of the oncoming history of the solar system, that the continued existence of mankind depends on an application of creativity, of human-type creativity, which enables us to modify conditions within the solar system, or, or eventually to get the hell out of here before the place blows up, about two billion years from now or something. Huh? Huh? So that's, that is what the policy is. We have now going to, not to adapt to what we find in terms of living processes on Earth and so forth. We have to now create the processes which are going to define humanity's role in the solar system and beyond. Mm -hmm. huh? And that's the missing point. And all of these economists who very carefully limit themselves to regurgitating what was done yesterday hmm? and say doing more of it or less of it. And we look at the governments of the world today. The, most of the governments of the world are unfit to exist. Not unfit to exist because we want to kill them, but unfit to exist because they refuse to adapt to the principles, known principles of, of economy, which will save them. They reject life. The greedy rejects life. Now, the greedy may not be committing suicide today, but he is killing the human species today with his policy and his way of thinking. The greedy is the enemy of mankind. He's a traitor to mankind from one within the human species because he's doing exactly the things which would mean the extinction of the human species. 
And this is the great issue which is not treated effectively in most of the treatments on biological processes. Mm -hmm. That the ability of man to exercise and project what is called creativity is unique. We have just had some discussion recently on the question of music. Yeah? On what, what is done by Fred Wengler. Mm -hmm. Fred Wengler's great discovery. Fretfinger has demonstrated a principle which is unique to mankind, like fire bringing, hmm? absolutely unique to mankind, which, which is related to directly to what we call cr human creativity. In other words, without this principle which is unique to mankind, which is known as human creativity, distinct from that of any other species, the possibility of the continued existence of mankind is not possible. And yet the very thing we're doing as, as a society today is we are adapting to the zero growth, go along to get along kind of mentality. We try to be acceptable to our, our fellow man. But what if your fellow man is acting like an ape rather than a human being? Our job is to, to, to turn human beings back into human beings and stop being monkeys. Mm -hmm. it, that's what the issue is here. We are going to go to Mars. We are going to develop Mars. Why and how? We're going to develop Mars because we're human. And we can't stand not doing it. Th that's the pioneer spirit. You go there because you would be ashamed of yourself if you didn't do it. And this is where human creativity comes into play. And the fellow who sits there and says, let's be traditional, as the Greeny does, is not fit to continue to exist. And if he runs society, society will not exist. So that's this question of leadership. Mm -hmm. which, and this all goes to this whole biological system. Before there was human creativity, there was life. And life, when it progressed, developed, produced human creativity. Our job is to progress in maintaining human creativity as such and going beyond what human creativity is today. And this will probably come through the development of the next higher order of energy flux density which will be the day that we go to Mars within a week mm -hmm. and can return through thermonuclear fusion. So we're headed toward now to escape from the mere kind of fusion we use now, use now but thermonuclear fusion. That's the, that's the point we aim for. That's where the change comes that's where man begins to move into the solar system and beyond. Mm -hmm. We start now by keep trying to beat off some of these rocks that threaten to destroy that, the Earth, and that sort of thing. But we're headed toward a deliberate commitment as fast as possible to the successful mastery and deployment of thermonuclear fusion, a transition which is not possible without human creativity as distinct from this crazy president and other kinds of degenerates. We must carry man forward into higher states than mankind has ever been before, at least on this, in this system. And that's our mission, and that is the mission of creativity. And creativity is not encouraged in this society. People say they're creative, they, they steal something, they call it creative. <laughs> but this is the great challenge. The great challenge is to recognize that creativity is a phenomenon in the universe which to our knowledge is unique, unique to mankind. There is no evidence of any other species than mankind which is capable of creativity and especially most of our economists today. You see that with what you brought up with the introduction of the use of fire. Yeah. It really is the first species that has a willful intention 
to transform its environment and to bring into existence a higher future that no other species has ever been able to willfully change its relationship to its environment. And you actually have funny things that come out of that with the use of fire, where now you have the ability to willfully, say, cook meats, or you're breaking down the proteins before you digest them. That actually resulted in an actual change in the, own, in the physiology of man himself, yeah. right, where his own torso changed from sort of the bigger stomach and distended stomach into you know, a, you know, a different kind of internal organization of his biology occurred through the use of fire. So here you have a species which is willfully transforming its own physiology and its own relationship to the life and the general environment around it. But doing it always from the standpoint of realizing in the present the, the coming into existence of a future state. Mm -hmm. And that really gets at, I think, the essence of what you have with man too that man exists and lives outside of our standard notion of what we consider as time. Where we're always operating from a time which is the future, but it's a future which is operating now to realize a higher existence. It's not just a linear future, it's actually, it has a, it's a transcendental future. Exactly. Exactly. Because the idea of human creativity is not a one-time shot. Right. Human creativity is the essence of mankind. Mm -hmm. Human creativity is the purpose of existence of mankind. And human, the human creativity requires a transformation of other processes in the universe according to the principle of creativity. Right. Huh? This is the problem you see with a lot of the younger generations because the nation doesn't have that kind of a mission for the future. So the, the inherent creative nature of man is being suppressed. And so you create this kind of very existential culture where people have no sense of why they exist, for what reason do they exist. Take now, if we start to introduce this kind of a moon Mars program to people, you start to now, in a very, you know, what could be a fairly short order, you awaken that creative spark in people because now you're presenting them with a sense of what the future could be and what the purpose of their life could be. Take the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Revolution, mm -hmm. which it was extended for over two decades, which transformed the United States and transformed the planet, actually mm -hmm. its policy. Huh? Mm -hmm. Think of what's happened since then. Think of what's happening now. There's a volatile, particularly since the assassination of Jack Kennedy. Yeah. Jack Kennedy was inspired to move in the direction of progress, real progress. Huh? Yeah. He had uh, sympathy with other people who were thinking in the same direction from the post-World War II period. Uh, Charles de Gaulle in France, the same thing. That, you take the French presidents these days, crap compared to Charles de Gaulle. Huh? Mm -hmm. The man who had his own idiosyncrasy, but the man was a genius. And he had a commit, he was a genius because he had a commitment. Huh? And you had other people, the same kind of thing coming out of World War II period, who as leaders had this same direction, sense of direction. Now let's free ourselves of this oppression. Let's build something good. Mm -hmm. That was the de, de Gaulle's policy. You look at what his, his, his laid down his policy of his presidency. And Jack Kennedy went the same direction. Since that time, with exceptional cases in relative isolation, the United States policy has been go to hell. And it got worse and worse. Our leaders are not leaders. Right. They're plugged up anuses. <laughs> are worse. And that this, is, this is where the problem lies. We, we don't have, what we must get at is to instill in people an understanding of what the nature of the human potential is. Mm -hmm and how that human potential defines mankind as a species, or what a species must be, and thus will influence mankind to stop this nonsense and get ahead and start changing things in the direction which, to which the solar system is now beckoning us. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bernatsky had a very clear conception of this. Absolutely. He had the conception that 
scientific thought as an actual geological force. Like that's an actual physical force of transformation. As so if you take that, like you're saying, as soon as you introduce fire, now you're now society is dependent upon a different, a non-biological substance, a non-biological entity in the universe, which mankind can uniquely wield, wield and generate and uh, continue to uh, bring into being and is a substance of mankind's progress. But if you recognize that as a, you know, this formulation, I think is very, I like his formulation of it. You know, scientific thought is an actual geological phenomenon. It's a physical phenomenon. So what you're saying when you see, then when you, so when you attack that, if you're attacking that substance, that's death. That's killing people. Yeah. Because people depend upon that actual substance, that actual physical action that the human mind is creating, an actual physical action in the universe as a physical manifestation, and it's a substance on which society depends. Yeah. So you attack that, like the Greens do. That is that is death. That's murder. It's, and so it's murder. Yeah, exactly. That's murder. That's exactly what it is. Because that's what the human species is. It's that's that. The, it's the not a biological the species. The greedy is a mass murderer by type. And so now we're at the point where, you know, human scientific thought needs to be beyond just a geological force. We're at the point where scientific thought needs to be a solar system force. Really? Actually, it's physical manifestation and the transformation of the solar system as a whole. Well, look at what's happening in Russia. The orientation mm -hmm. of the Russian scientists under the, uh, the, we call it, the this presidency of Russia, mm -hmm. it represents exactly that. Yeah. An attempt to break into resuming that conception of mankind. Right. In, in Russia itself, on, in Earth, in the immediate vicinity of Earth, the defense of Earth mm -hmm. is an example of that. And when we get to thermonuclear fusion, as a mode of transportation and work and so forth, where we have now, again, all, everything about time is now changed. The definition of time has changed with, with that. that. That change is, is what we must bring on. Anything that opposes that is the enemy of mankind's existence. Mm -hmm. And when people are doing it, are, who are opposing this, are criminals. They may not intend to be criminals, Right. But their behavior is habitual, therefore they're habitual criminals. And they should cut it out. Hmm? And that should be the doctrine which we somehow instill in people to recognize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because human creativity, which is lacking in most all of our economists, at least by profession, they may have secret nourishing thoughts about <laughs> creativity, but they're hiding them carefully from their colleagues. <laughs> at least so far. And look at the presidents we choose. They're rubbish. From a standpoint of a human species question, they're rubbish. We should probably put them out in the garden and if they, <laughs> where they can have a chance to ripen, perhaps. Mm -hmm. At least use them as fertilizer. I would, no, I wouldn't do that. It's cool. <laughs> I would say give them a chance to do their own ripening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this Russian policy, it's across the board. We were at this uh, event in D.C. a few weeks ago bunch of, uh, pretty much all the major space agencies were represented. I don't think China made it, but a few others made it. Most of them are there. The only agency that presented a real coherent program, an actual coherent program of a fundamental advance was the Russian program. Mm -hmm. They're the only people that actually presented a whole conception about, you know, they, I think being intentionally provocative in saying it, but saying, look, we're sick of just these low Earth orbit uh, missions. We're sick of just getting into orbit, orbiting the Earth. We've been doing that for, for what, 50, 40 years, right? They, they, and they defined a very clear full colonization of the moon as an immediate 15-year objective. That's a very interesting case because the Russians in general as individuals had pretty much lost that inspiration. What has happened under the, the attacks Putin, on the 90s. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 it, Putin and company have been shown the ability under the appropriate conditions to induce a population to return to its potential of an earlier period. It comes out as a sense of pride. In the Russian case, it comes out as a sense of shame, hmm. a sense of personal shame for the fact that this, this degeneration has been allowed to occur. Hmm. What you've seen with the Putin phenomenon is the success of Putin in winning this last election after the presidency has actually changed the character of the self-identity 
of the Russian personality. Not for every Russian, but you find that in the Russian population, there is now a new, a renaissance of commitment to progress. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the bastards, the British bastards, are upset about, is the fact that they, the, the species, the Russian species, so-called, is still alive. And its example is encouraging other people in other parts, other countries of the world mm -hmm. to fight too and not to capitulate. And that's what you get with the, you know, the dignity of our general, uh, generals, leading generals. The same thing. They're operating out of basis of a certain kind of humanistic pride not to give up, not to betray the nation, to fight as, as hard as you can and as well as you can to save the nation and save civilization. And that's the, what the thing that used to spread that as an infection, to spread among people a sense of pride in progress and a sense of shame if you don't work to progress. That's what's needed. And you see the people in our own country who capitulate to this, this bestialization which this beast in, in the presidency, in the White House, represents. We are no longer human. We've given up on it. We become people who vote for Obama. And a lot of people in the United States are not thinking in that direction right now. And Obama doesn't like that one bit. Hmm. Nor does do the British. The British want us to be, destroy ourselves and done everything they could to bring that about. But now, Russia has done something with Putin, with his election, in bringing back a sense of pride among nations which had lost their sense of pride, which were kissing the rear end of the British. And you see, as the breakdown of the European system, it's a menace, it's a danger to the existence of everybody in Europe, this collapse. But at the same time, it is the discredit of what the British represents. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that somehow this will become infectious enough so that Europeans will join us in getting rid of the British plague. And we will even free the British of the <laughs> British plague. And I think many of the British today, if they had their choices, would prefer that. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic in that sense. Fighting optimism is the only kind that works. Mm -hmm. all right. Sounds good. All right. On that note, we'll wrap it up. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>